Um, it is good, I think, when at times things don't go according to plan. That's all right. So you guys did a great job of adjusting that. Parents, we know what that's like on a daily basis. You get up and you think you've got the schedule organized, but it just does not happen. Um, grandparents, <clears throat> you were there. <clears throat> you understand. You appreciate that. But the one thing that was happening, uninterrupted, God was being worshipped. And so it is good to be together in God's house. Um, I was, you know, I've, I've told you last week a pretty good story about my dad, and I've kind of dropped some truth bombs about him over the last couple of months. Um, you know, I, I was forced to learn how to drive a diesel pickup truck because my mom's inability and my dad's near, near death experience. So this morning, I could not avoid that kind of thing with it being Father's Day. Now, there's a couple of things that um, you will hear from me for the coming years um, about my dad, but one of the things is I want you to know he is absolutely a man of God. Um, I remember when he was still alive that for most of my life, I would wake up and I would, you know, reluctantly get up and get about the day, getting ready for school, whether it was elementary school, middle school, high school, and even coming back after college. And there were times that we would come home for Christmas and we stay and I would go downstairs and I would go into the kitchen to grab something neat. I would look down the other end of the hallway where my parents had a living room, fireplace, TV, and the light was on. And it could be six in the morning. It could be seven in the morning. And I remember one time I, I got curious as to what the light was on, because my dad was one of those sticklers about leaving lights on on accident. Like, it just was a pet peeve of him, and so I thought, I caught him. I caught him. He left the light on last night when he went to bed. I got him, and I walked into the living room, and there he is with the biggest Bible I've ever seen in my life, with the biggest cover on it, and he's sitting in his chair, and he's reading Scripture, and he's listening to somebody read the Scripture along with him, and he's just sitting there meditating. And there were times I would walk in and he would have that book open. He would just be reading it and meditating. Sometimes it was a, a pages of reading. And sometimes it was a, a passage that he would just sit and focus on. And then there were times the book was closed and off to the side and he was just there meditating. Sometimes he was praying out loud by himself. And sometimes it was just moments of a tranquil peace as I walked in. And he just seemed to be in, in, in a presence, right? In God's presence. And I remember growing up with that kind of father. Now, my other siblings, and there's... There were um, four other siblings besides me who were much older than, than I am, much less intelligent, and much, much uglier than I am. <laughs> None of them come to this church, <laughs> and they, I doubt they watch us online. So, uh, but I, I grew up in a different generation. My sister, my natural sister, full-born sister, she had a different father growing up. And I had a father who was, who was pretty gentle. He was older in age and had, had learned some things of wisdom, and God had softened his heart towards um, how to live life a little bit. But I remember there were those moments when the hardness would come out. And my father was a disciplinarian as well as being this tender-hearted giant. And so, you know, there were days when he would come home and I could not wait. Summer days that, you know, it was kind of boring at home. I've, I've watched enough noonday TV with mom, all the F Troop and, and, and Hogan's Heroes and, and all the other kind of shows that come on at noontime when I was a kid. And, and then dad would drive up. And I would hear the garage door open, and it was all I could to put down whatever I was doing, stop watching TV, stop playing games, and head out because dad's home. And I remember running out in the garage as a little kid and just like running into him, like running into him, trying to embrace him. My dad was a big dude. At that time when I was like, you know, six, seven years old, he was 6'3", weighed like 320 pounds. He was a massive man. And I remember when I went to go hug him, it was like I couldn't get past the circumference, <laughs> right? Not even halfway around because my little arms couldn't make it. And I remember being older and that same kind of thing, we would come home and be excited to see my dad. But then there were those days, and they were few and far between. My sister would tell you they were, should have been more often, but there were those days that when the garage door began to come up, that absolute t terror and fear set upon me. Now, my dad hadn't necessarily changed. It wasn't like he called home and said, hey, uh, Patsy, uh, I'm coming home today, and, and I'm ready to uh, chew gum and mow some grass and take care of some people. And, and the grass was mowed yesterday. I'm out of bubble gum, and I'm coming to find that kid, right? He didn't make that phone call. So it wasn't that my dad had changed. <laughs> there was something changed within me. And the issue would have been I broke a lamp, right? Maybe I, I did something I wasn't supposed to. went to somebody's house I shouldn't have gone to. Maybe I ate something I shouldn't have. Maybe, maybe whatever it was, there was something that little Kevin did that was breaking the rules, and my mom said those magic words. Wait until your father gets home. 
Now, my mom could take care of business. It wasn't like my mom was all nice and soft and cuddly. Of the two people in my family, my father was the one who would give hugs. My mom's not a big hug giver. So she could take care of business if she wanted to, but she knew that there was a level that she would go to, and then when dad got involved, there was a whole different level. It was another chapter, it was another adventure, and he would come home, and there was that one belt in, in the closet. And he wore a business belt, and he had his tie, but he would come home, and when I would hear the, the, ching, the, you know, the tingling of the belt buckle, I knew it was business, right? And I'm looking for any place in the house, but then the terror would set in because my dad would tell me, it's bad if you get a whooping, but if you run from me, <laughs> it's gonna be worse. And I tried that once or twice, and I'm here to tell you, it was worse. But that terror of if I've done something wrong, when my father showed up, you know, the sweat beads and, the, and the, you, your heart began to race and you had dry mouth and it's like the whole fight and flight and, and freeze syndrome. And oftentimes I would freeze. But then there are other times, which was most of my life, it was the sheer joy of him coming home. And it all depended upon what I had done, my actions. And so on Father's Day, you know, Parents, you got to know, and I'm sure this with my kids, that dads, that, that we love you guys. I mean, we, we definitely have given a lot of credit for what you've done, but we remember those moments. We remember the times when you had us by the arm and we kept going in circles, right? <laughs> it was like, like taking care of trying to break a horse, right? We remember those moments when we had the stern lecturing. We remember the moments where our life seemed to be within an inch of it ending and Jesus was coming soon and sometimes we were praying for that and sometimes we were hoping that Jesus would hold off for a moment, but dad is right there. And so we do love you, but there's also a sense of fear. And that's okay if it's a healthy fear. And we've tried to instill that in our kids. There's an appropriate amount of fear that needs to be had as a deterrent, but also for you to know an incredible amount of love also exists. And this morning, um, I want us to, to drop back a week. We ended last week with, with Joshua and, and the nation of Israel doing some incredible things. We've been going through this series called Take a Step. And, and really what it is, it's looking how Jesus is, is foreshadowed, is represented by Joshua. And we go back to the beginning where, where God spoke to Joshua, do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous because I'm going to use you to give these people the land that they should inherit. Now, 40 years earlier, they had made a mistake and they acted out of fear and they wanted the desert in 40 years of discipline. But now it's, it's time to walk into the promised land. And last week, they've crossed the river and they faced this massive city and they don't have to lift a finger against the wall. God takes care of business and does it perfectly in such a way that they can conquer the city and do the things he's called them to do. The one command that he gave them that they had to obey now, he gave them instructions on how to walk, but he was one command that he gave them. Do not take anything of the things that have been devoted to destruction. When they prepared for the, to the march around the city, Joshua gave those instructions. When you take the city, the things that are inside the city are not yours. They belong to God. He has devoted them to destruction. And I say that because it's important to understand the phrasing. Devoted to destruction. Now, let me just say, as we jump into today's scripture, there was a great victory. I mean, I don't know if any American allied World War I, World War II, Battle of 1812, Revolutionary War, any instance that would equal what God did through the nation of Israel against the city of Jericho. And in the moment of celebration, and in the moment of greatness, and in the moment of, of awesomeness that God has done this, chapter two comes. Well, not chapter two, the next chapter. It's actually chapter seven, right? So in the moment of great celebration and victory with it, you think, man, the Israelites, they are on a roll. They are marching with God, and he is in control, and they're going to just take out this, this country, this land, no problem, and they will inherit it, and they will become the priesthood people. They're going to do exactly what God called them to do. And then verse one of the next chapter begins. And so if you have your scriptures, open up to Joshua chapter seven. Because what I want you to, to listen to is to this account. Now I wanna draw you back to something that was said through Rahab. As you go to chapter seven of Joshua, remember there was a part where Rahab's talking to the spies. And what does she say? We understand that your God is the God. 
we have heard what he has done to the other kings and what he has done to the, the Red Sea and all the things that he has done has demonstrated his power and our people's hearts have melted like water. Do you remember that? I mean, that's an incredible thing. And the spies come back and tell Joshua, hey, we've got this city. We know that they, they've given up already. The, the war is already over with. Because of what God has done, he has crushed them just by his stories. Now, that's incredible, right? To know that, that because of what God was doing, there was this thing that says, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. If I'm going to have to go up against something, and I'm choosing to go up against a brick wall or some, some, some you know, shallow water, I'm going to take the water option. I watched last night as there was a going away party for the Yatemans, and it's just raining cats and dogs. And parents are trying to figure out, how do we keep these kids out of the lightning and thunderstorm? But all the dads are like, get out, go, go play, go play. And the kids are running around in this rainstorm. And it rained two inches last night. And then Warren breaks out the, the uh, slip and slide and actually turns the water hose on with all the rain coming down. And all the little boys are out there just going crazy like a bunch of monkeys slip and sliding. Now, there was one particular instance where we had a, a grown man who was participating in this also takes out a young kid, and it's all fun and games. No one got hurt that I know of. At least that kid doesn't remember getting hurt, <laughs> right? And so in this great moment, there's like, if I've got to choose to slide on gravel or water, I'm going to choose water because it doesn't hold up much resistance. And they say if you're traveling at 60 miles an hour off of a bridge or off of a high dive and you hit water, it can be like hitting concrete. But in the slip and slide instance, Man, give me water every day over gravel, dirt, rocks. I don't want that. I want the water. But this isn't describing the people of Jericho. Read along with me, starting in verse 1. It says, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zebedi, and son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now jump down to verse 4. So now they're, they're looking at this city, right? So we've been given verse 1 and 2 kind of as a precursor. The, the writer wants us to know that they've come up this great victory, but there's something bad in the camp. So in verse 4 it writes, after they've staked out the city of Ai and they've come back with a report of how they should attack this, this is the report. So about 3,000 men went up from, from the people and they fled before the men of Ai. Now, Ai is supposed to be this small little city of farmers, this, this, un, this defenseless city that really can't take care of itself. And they've decided instead of sending the entire army, they're going to send a representative, a small little enclave of men to go and attack the city. It shouldn't be a big deal. But what we realize is that at, at the moment they go into battle, it says they fled. The nation of Israel fled before Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men, that being the Israelites, and chased them before the gate as far as Sherebrim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So we're not talking about the, the people living in Canaan. We're not talking about the people living in, in, in the promised land that God is removing. We're talking about the Israelites. That they went against this small city, this village, and they had their backsides handed to them. And their response now is, they've got these hearts that are melting. Jump to Joshua 7, verse 9. Joshua tears his clothes and goes before God and repentful. He goes before God in a contrite spirit. He's afraid. He's, he's wondering, what have I done? And God begins to have an interaction with him. But what, what Joshua proclaims to, to God is this. Joshua says, and what will you do for your great name? God responds. We're going to jump down to verse 25 and 26. And so after God responds, this isn't you, this is actually something in the camp. There is a family that has done something. And they took the devoted things. And so now I'm going I'm to root the sin out that's in the camp, and I'm going to bring them tribe by tribe and family by family that are come before you. We're going to eradicate this. And after that's done, then I'm going to give you some new instructions. And Joshua, when they find out that it's this particular family, Joshua looks at him in verse 25 and says, why did you bring trouble on us? This is what he says to Achan when it's discovered that Achan's the one who sinned. 
The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remain to this day. Then the Lord turned his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor, which means trouble. I'm gonna finish this passage up, our reading today in verse, uh, chapter eight, verses one and two. Once that's taken care of, once, once the sin has been exposed and eradicated and dealt with, then it says this, starting in verse one of chapter eight. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hands the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land, and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoils and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. So what should have been an easy victory ends up being a, a great defeat. But what's happening is, is that God is showing Joshua that there's something wrong in the camp. Now, there's a lot of things to teach in this, in this chapter. You can go through and read chapter 8. This is two chapters of information and teachings. And I would tell you, go back this week and reread through those two chapters. You could talk about um, discovering sin in your life. And, and I've taught on this principle before, but you know, the ability to take every aspect of who you are as a believer and who you are as a person and bring it before God. And I would tell you, fathers, today, that is one great thing I would challenge you to do. To lay yourself before God and let him examine you. And if there's anything that is displeasing to him or disobedient, allow him to deal with it. Maybe it's you as a father. Let him see that. Let him speak into it. Maybe he wants to demonstrate his love towards you and say, you're doing a great job. Keep up. But maybe there's some correction to make. Maybe it's as a, a husband. Maybe it's as a son. Maybe it's as an employee or a manager or an owner or a community member or a part of a board or whatever. What are the different aspects of your life? And in, in life, you can see in the scripture, you bring each one before God and he'll begin to reveal things. And sometimes we're scared to do that because that's like we're waiting for God to show us the bad things and he's gonna punish us. But really what he does is he exposes it for the purposes of correction. Now, when I read this story and I think about one family one man did something that was disobedient. I mean, he took some, some, some you know, capes, maybe, some, some ropes. He took some, some gold and silver. I mean, seriously, it, why is God getting so really distraught about this? The items aren't the problem. You see, in the moment that Achan goes in and takes those things, he becomes the God of his own life. He disobeys God's order, he does the thing God asked him not to do, and the things that he took became his God, the way for him to supply for himself, the way for him to secure for himself, and God cannot stand in the, in the, in the presence of disobedience against him. There, there is a heavy context to this, to think that one person's sin would cause the entire nation to stumble. What if God showed up in this moment and examined us as a church? You think he would find one person with sin? He wouldn't have to go far past the stage. <laughs> we, we are sinful people. Now, we are redeemed people also. But I guarantee you, children, your parents have made mistakes this week. They have sinned. Parents, you know your kids have sinned. You've seen it. And so what does it mean for us that as we try to live as a community, that one person's sin will disrupt what the community can do, how we can together follow God and his calling on us? You see, it's not just Kevin Britton as the pastor of CWC that has a calling, but it's me living in relationship with all of you and us working together to present the gospel to the city of Perryton. And he's called us to do that in a unified way. And so we have to consider, how do my sins affect the, the testimony of David? How do my sins affect the testimony of James? How do my sins affect the testimony of Jessica? And I don't know that we ever consider that because we are such independent people, we think, well, my sins are my sins. But fathers, we've stood out here a couple of times looking at our families 
and we've watched our kids do something, and it brings us absolute terror because why? We have done the same thing. And we think to ourselves, boys will be boys. I used to do that, look how I turned out. <laughs> and your wife says, that's the problem. <laughs> There's a heavy weight to this, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna to remove that weight from us. Think of it this way. If I'm walking in my house at night, and, and the way our, our house is set up, as some of you know, there is a hers bathroom and a his bathroom. Okay, now it's pretty easy for me to get from my side of the bed to his bathroom, but there is an obstacle here. And if I kick that obstacle, great pain and anguish and weeping and gnashing of teeth will come. And there's probably two of those things. There's a little drop off from the bedroom out to the bathroom. And if I miss that, I'm falling into this little glass brick wall. So it's like fraught with dangers. But if I kick the corner of this chest of drawers with my pinky toe, right? It's like, Jesus, come now and deliver me from this pain. Okay, my, my wife's great-grandfather. When we first got married, we inherited this beautiful cherry wood bedroom set, full-size bed. And we were grateful. But when we got it, I noticed that there were these pink strings hanging off the corners of the bed, towards the foot of the bed. And I'm, I was completely confused because, you know, pink streamers on a husband and wife bed, it's, that doesn't add up. That doesn't match that beautiful cherry wood. And then I got to look closer and those pink streamers are held in place by staples. This is antique cherry wood furniture. And so I had to go to her grandmother and say, um, Miss Roselle, why are there staples and pink streamers hanging from the bedroom suit? But well, one night, Grandpa OMB got up, was going to the bathroom, and he kicked the corner edge of the bed and broke a pinky toe on his right foot. And so after anguish and falling on the ground, passing out, I don't know what all he went through, he got up and took a pink towel and took a staple gun and stapled it to the corner to pad that corner to protect himself. A couple of nights later, guess what happened? He's walking around the other side and kicks the other side with his left foot and breaks that pinky toe. And guess what he did? Took a pink towel. I mean, I don't know why they have so many pink towels, but he took a pink <laughs> towel and he stapled it against the bed and tried to protect himself, okay? No, no, here's the problem. If we do that and I break that pinky toe and I don't take care of it, you know what can happen? Infection can set in. True story. A friend of mine, and this is a warning to you, Carmen and Grant, a friend of mine who moved to Australia, when he got there, he was an American citizen, been living in Australia as a pastor in, in the southern part of the country, um, in Portsmouth, by the way. He kicked the bed with his pinky toe, it broke it, it got infected and had to be amputated. Don't, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so what happens then? If you break this toe and it gets infected, do you just cut the toe off? Well, the problem is if you don't take care of that infection and it can settle in the bloodstream and it can land on the brain and cause all kinds of problems. The smallest thing in your body, the smallest appendage, this little pinky toe that has the funky little toenail on it that really has no use, gets broken, gets infected, can kill you. And I think for us as a body, we have to understand the serious nature of what sin does unresolved in the body of Christ is detrimental. It is not a topic to be taken lightly. But I have a hard time coming and helping you deal with that speck that's in your eye because God has told me there's a whole piece of wood sticking out of my eye. So how do we do this together? Well, see, that's not really the point of the today's sermon. You see, the point of today's sermon is simply this. We become what we worship. You see, Achan was one man in the nation of Israel, and his sin caused the fall of, of Israel against a small contingent of, of soldiers who were not well trained. And God is using this to show the nation of Israel, you cannot let sin dwell in the body. Period. You must deal with it. And it's not like you just kind of put it off to the side, but you have to deal with it severely. And God shows that the moment that Achan took the things that were devoted to destruction, you know what he became? A thing of destruction. He became what he was worshiping. 
the possessions he was after, the, the things that he thought would bring him money and respect and take care of his family, they were devoted to destruction. They were to be destroyed. And in Achan worshiping that, he becomes a thing of destruction. When we worship the things of this world, and we get there from time to time, we become like the world. I think it's important for us to understand that even as Christians, if we worship the things that are temporary, we become those things. Does it mean you lose your salvation? No, but what it does mean is you begin to operate with the tools of the world that are based on temporary things, selfish motives, and destructive ideas. And so the moment that we worship the things of the world, we become like the world, and guess what? We become ignorant. We become blind. We become deceived, and we become defeated. As Christians, this is the thing that we have to be careful of. I don't like what's happening. I'm going to make the changes myself. I'm not happy here, and so I'm going to change everything about this to make me happy. And what happens is we forget to rely upon God. We see in the storyline that God is not bent on, on Israel not having resources. When they go into Ai and they've, they've, they've done this, this confession thing, God gives them all the spoils of battle. But he wants to know that their hearts are not going to be focused on those things, but continue to be focused on him because he doesn't walk them walking around ignorant of what he's doing. He doesn't want them to be blind to the things that are happening around them to see them from his perspective. He doesn't want them to be deceived that the good things are bad and the bad things are good. And if I compromise in one area of integrity, it's okay, it's just one instance and it serves a greater good. Now that's deception. And he doesn't definitely want us to live defeated lives. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, you worship what you become. And if we worship the world, it'll begin to conform us. Right? That's what Paul talks about the Roman church. Don't be conformed any longer, but be transformed into something different. So if this is the temptation, if what we become, we worship, right, that thing transforms us to, to make it in its likeness, then there is there something hopeful here. You see, the good thing is, there's a worship of God that can take place. I hope this morning, as you sit here and you've read scripture and you listen to this message, you can go back in your life and give praise to God for the way that he has broken the cycles of destruction in your own life that there was a moment that the old self would have acted in, in a certain way that would have been destructive, but praise God, there's a new self that exists and God's doing some amazing things. You see, the thing is, is that when we worship God, guess who we become like? Christ. There's the reason that Christ was captured in the scriptures so that we can understand what he did. There's a reason that we are inspired to read those things because he gave us a model of what it was like to live in relationship with God. And the more I worship God, the more that he transforms me to be able to worship him and to be able to live in relationship with him. By my fallen nature, I cannot exist in that same space. But God in his mercy is transforming me to become more like Christ. And I am not a done product yet, but I get to experience some goodness along the way. And in that moment, when we become more like Christ, we are blessed because we continue to grow in our knowledge. We begin to see things from his perspective. We become aware of what's going on around us in a supernatural way, and we get to live victoriously. Now, I think if I were to, to, to poll you and if I asked you questions, had you take a test to choose between A or B, what do you want to worship? I think most of you in here would probably choose the, the God answer. I want to worship God, and I came here this morning because I am worshiping God, and I think I'm becoming like Christ, and there's evidence of that. There's this fruit thing that's starting to be produced in my life, and, and I'm seeing these things. I'm growing in my knowledge, but I'm also growing in my spiritual awareness and my spiritual eyes, and, and in this thing here, victorious, and my family is thriving right now. But see, there's a problem. Because what we see in the scripture, um, as, as it was written down by a, a theologian, and his name is um, Howard, D.M. Howard Jr., and he wrote this. He said, in the moment we see in this scripture, in the holistic idea between chapters one and chapter eight, 
that there was a storyline where a Canaanite woman who was a prostitute acted more like an Israelite in her demonstration of faith. And in this moment, we see an Israelite who's called to live a holy life act more like a Canaanite who is an atheist and disregarding God when he worships the things of this world. When Christians worship the things of the world, they don't mirror who Jesus is. And so if I'm going to bring out on Mother's Day the lessons of a prostitute, guess what, fathers? The same lesson still exists. If I've got to choose between having the right heritage and pedigree and the right upbringing as a pair, compared to the right relationship and demonstrating the rightness in my life because of what the Spirit's doing, give me the right relationship any day of the week. Because if I depend upon my, her my heritage and my legacy and the, the faith of my father, I'm not worshiping God. I'm worshiping a man. And I would challenge you this morning, what is it you're becoming? You see, the crazy thing is, is that when we worship things, we kind of live in this temporary state. How many of you have ever found long-term satisfaction from speaking bad about another person? How many of you have found long-term satisfaction when you have robbed someone in a business deal? When you've cheated someone out of land? When you've taken honor from your kids trying to find a moment to be funny? When you've taken the honor from your spouse and, 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 and the, 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 um, the, the honor that they should receive because what God's doing in them and you try to make a joke at their expense and you've robbed them of that so you can have a momentary laugh. How many times have we found satisfaction in temporary things? It's like taking a flat tire and taking the bubble gum out of your mouth and sticking it on there and reinflating the tire and trying to go down the road. It's not gonna last long. And in fact, you might put your confidence in that when the tire fails again, you may end your life in destruction. But what God says is that when you worship me, the things that are temporary are put under my authority and I will change them for eternity. That the trust I put in his hands and walk by his might and live in his power, those things never end. You got two choices, right? Speak bad or speak good. This one ends up killing everybody involved. This one brings life to those who hear it. This is the eternal and this is the temporary. It's the evidence of what you worship. You see, at one point, I was like Achan. At one point, you were like Achan. You sinned, and you earned destruction. I sinned, and I earned destruction. I lived a life, the scripture says, I was a rebellious child living in rebellion, fighting against God. And here's the place of heaviness for me this morning. I should be aching. There should be a rubble of rocks in South Irving in front of a two-story house where Kevin was destroyed because of his disobedience. In fact, if I were to be honest, there would probably be like multiple rubbles of rock. How many times did I make bad choices and, and do things disobediently? And then you move from there to 604 Cactus Court. See, I grew up at 1616, but I had a family at 604, and how many, how many piles of rubble would be there because of my destruction? And then I moved from 604 to 15528 in Virginia, and how many, how many rubbles would be there because of destruction? And then, then I moved to 1509 Texas. How many rubbles would be there in the last 10 months? You see, I have earned over and over again the destruction that happened to Achan. I'm not separated from that. But praise God, because of Jesus Christ, he's the one who took the rubble. Amen? He is the one. It says in Scripture that when they found out what the sin was, and Achan even confessed, I'm the one who did this. They went to his tent, they found the articles, and they stoned him and they burned him. Everything with him, what he owned, all of his possessions. And to this day, there's still the rubbles of rocks, according to the scripture, and it's called the Valley of Trouble, the Valley of Achor. And that should be me, but Jesus said, I got this. And he stepped in, and he took my place. There's a song that says, it feels like you got away with something, right? 
Well, guess what? You got away with something. And Jesus, in his obedience to God, said, I will take what you earned. But today, I feel like I'm like Rahab. Why? Because I'm forgiven and redeemed. Church, do you feel this? Do you, do you love this place? Is this a good place to be? I don't have to walk around with rubbles of, of dirt and rocks and being burned, but I can live in freedom because Jesus took this place, he gives me this place. And I want you to walk away today. We've had a great celebration of, of committing our children to be raised in the church so they can seek after God. This is what you wanna teach them. This is who you are, and this is who God is calling you to be. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and live this life. There's not many times in our culture we would take the lessons of a prostitute and take them over the person who by pedigree should be living the right life. But praise God that this is the case. And I wanna live that way. And then we can walk and say this. Jesus, who is my strength and courage, forgives and redeems. Amen, right? And I can take a step into this life. I can walk into any situation and over and over again, I will praise him because he is changing me. I am not doomed by sin, but I am loved because of grace. Now, you're gonna be challenged with this. You're gonna, you're gonna be challenged with what you worship and sometimes you're gonna be tempted to worship other things that are temporal and sometimes you're gonna be reminded that you've worshiped in ways that are temporary in flesh, in the world. That you've put your faith in those systems and you think that economy meets your needs and God brings you back and says, walk with me. And there's a chance for the rubble to be heaped upon my head, to have thrown stones thrown at me and not only that, but to be burned because of Jesus Christ and his amazing grace and God's amazing work, I can live forgiven and redeemed. I don't wanna beat this dead horse about our sins, but I do think we have to understand where we come from. And my challenge for you this week is this. In those moments when you see Achan come out, do you hope and pray that Rahab will win out? In those moments when the old self that's supposed to be buried with Christ and his death, when that person tries to come and fight itself out of the grave, do you find yourself praying to Jesus Christ, let that dead thing die. Cover it again, heap it up, put semen on it, put it in an iron box, let it never find the light of day again because I wanna live like the Son of God. I wanna become more and more like Jesus Christ. And that may take us confessing things to God. That will take us confessing things to each other. That will take us praying for each other. You know where I started out in the storyline was the consequence of one person's sin and how it destroys the body. Because of this, and because I've experienced this, you can bet your bottom dollar that I'm praying for John because I know that our sins are gonna affect each other. And I'm gonna be lifting up Brian because I know that his sins affect us as a church and, and so do mine and they affect me and I affect him. And so I'm gonna be praying that each one of you walk in this victory, that you live out redeemed and forgiven lives. Because if you don't, the city of Periton will look at us and say God doesn't truly exist because this body of people can't exist. They can't do it, so he must not be real. And we supernaturally need him to change who we are so the city of Periton can see that there is a God, that he loves his people, that he sent his son to die on the cross, and he is redeeming them and forgives them and wants them to live in a loving, peaceful relationship with him. See, that makes sense when, when Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered together, there I am with them. Because the sweet fellowship reveals Christ and we realize the desperate need we have for him to change who we are so we can live in that fellowship. I'm gonna finish with this. Paul writes two different places, Romans chapter five and 1 Corinthians 15. And he said, you know what? Through one person, sin entered the world and death with it. That's Adam. Adam. And we have been haunted since that day in a broken relationship. 
But then Paul also relieves that disappointment and that disparity by revealing in the same way, through one person, life came to all people. And that's through Jesus Christ. That's the power that we have. That's the hope that we live in. That's the word that's spoken to us, that I'm not living defeated. I'm not living ignorant. I'm not living blind. I'm not living, um, you know, walking around, not understanding what's going on. But I have the ability, because of Jesus Christ and my relationship with God, to live victorious, to live understanding, growing in knowledge, seeing what he's doing, and joining in and participating on purpose. And I would encourage you as you walk out the doors today that you would walk and each day you pray that same thing. Make me aware. I want to be living and I want you to see me and I want to reflect Jesus Christ more and more every single day. And some days you'll take a step back, but I guarantee you if you pray that on a daily basis, you're going to find yourself taking more and more steps and those steps will look like the feet of Jesus Christ. And those steps will take you into places like Jaira. They'll take you to places like Guatemala. They'll take you to places like Nicaragua. They'll take you to places like Africa. They'll take you to places like Texas Street. They'll take you to places like Amherst. They'll take you to places like Harvard. And you'll walk these streets carrying the gospel. That that is the only thing that has the power to save lives. Why? Because you understand what it means to be forgiven and redeemed. And you're called to walk in that power. And so don't sit here. Don't wait here. But today, leave walking, carrying that message. We, because of Jesus Christ, will take a step in freedom and forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. It is a horrible story to hear how one man's disobedience brought him, he and his family destruction. But Father, what we, we pray is that you reveal that sinfulness in us. It's one thing to say that I may lose a pinky toe, but when we talk about it in terms of each other living in fellowship, this is an impossible thing that you've called us to do. And it's not a program, but it's the work of the Spirit that makes it happen. And so just because I attend a church doesn't mean that I'm, I'm doing the things you've called me to do. And so, Father, reveal in me where I've switched my faith in you, where I've turned my, 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 my desire for you into the desire of other things that are temporary. And like Achan, I walk in ignorance. And I experience defeat and destruction. And Father, more and more, I want my, the thing that I worship to make me more like Christ. And so draw my attention back to you. Father, I pray that for our people today. And sometimes it isn't always just business. It isn't always just the neighborhood or, or the kind of those temporal things. But Father, sometimes it's our health. Sometimes it's our relationships. And those things just seem to sabotage us. And so, Father, may those failed things draw us back to you. Father, I pray that as we have relationships in this church that are suffering at times, and maybe right now there are relationships that are suffering, that we would begin by asking you to seek us, forgive us. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, if I have a problem with my brother, I have to go solve that problem with him to ask for forgiveness and make things right, and then I can come to the altar of worship. And so, Father, I pray that you draw me to that action. If there's a, a relationship I have offense with, then I pray that you open the doors that we can have a conversation. Make me aware. Draw me to repentance. And I pray that as I have a conversation with that person, as we talk with each other, that, Father, we across this, this congregation would find an open heart ready to forgive and also ask to be forgiven. Because that is where joy is found, forgiveness and redemption. And so, Father, in this next moment, you've been speaking to your people. I pray that they would respond. Because it is a powerful day when the church of Jesus Christ can walk in unity, seeking after one God through one relationship to the Son, working under one spirit who is transforming us to become more and more like Christ. That is the testimony that will change the heart of Perryton. Not the colors of our chairs, not the genre of our worship and our music, not the lighting, Father, not the, the color of our carpet and the layout of our building and the donuts that we serve and great coffee and, and, and the, the cafe table. Those things will not save a single soul. It is Jesus Christ and him glorified. Let us carry that out to the city. And so, Father, now draw us to a place of response in this next moment as we pray. We pray this in Christ's name. I invite you to stand in this next moment. I invite our prayer team to come forward.
And, and maybe God has revealed to you that there's a place where there's an offense and you're gonna have to go take care of it. Until you do, you've got these, these devoted things hidden in your tent and God doesn't honor that. So it's one thing to ask for forgiveness, it's one thing to go make things right. M maybe there's some issue within your family and you as a father need to come to the table and start to bring forgiveness and, and repentance to that table. Maybe there's a relationship that's been broken for decades and you don't know how it got broken and don't know how to fix it off the top of your head. Man, lay that before God and ask for wisdom. But maybe this morning you just need to voice this to God. There are these people up here up front who would love to pray with you. Don't hesitate, come pray. There are people next to you who would love to pray with you. Don't hesitate, pray. In this next moment as God has been speaking to you, respond and let's pray together. As you pray where you are, you'll you notice there are names that are coming up on the screen, and maybe you just take a moment to pray over those names. These are people who have called in for specific prayer requests, and sometimes they're health-related, sometimes they're relationship-related, but we just invite you guys to pay attention to this as it scrolls through, and maybe you offer a prayer for the names that have been, have been given to us.
God is powerful this morning, every day. Love that we get to walk into his presence together. Let's close up the service in prayer. Father, I'm grateful. And Father, I hope I, I can share that gratitude with um, hundreds of other people in this room. To not live in a place of, of old memories of brokenness and sinfulness, but Father, that that would remind me of how much you love and care for me. And Father, I'm thankful that you do bring healing, that you do break old, old cycles and moments when we want to live under the temporary things of this world that breed nothing but destruction. Father, you break those things. You demonstrate your greatness. And what seems to be a reckless action of a shepherd that will leave 99 faithful sheep to go seek after one, I'm grateful for that reckless love. When it seems like it's, it's uncomprehensible that you would destroy this family to show us how important it is that sin be eradicated so that people can thrive and walk in obedience, Father, I'm, I'm thankful for that reckless love. But it doesn't make sense that you would forgive me when I know all the details of what I did and why I did it and how many times I've gone back to do it over and over again and yet your love and forgiveness still are given freely. That seems incredibly reckless, but I'm grateful for that love. And I pray that we walk out of here together as people giving thanks and praising you the rest of this day because of how you've demonstrated that love towards us. That Jesus, who is our strength and encouragement, and that Father, that he gives forgiveness and redemption. And we walk into this city living that lifestyle that we can celebrate this week than the defeat of sin that we can celebrate this week, Father, that you are truly victorious and you've drawn us into the victory camp. You've brought us to the table to celebrate this victory meal. And it isn't just for us, but Father, we wanna bring as many people as we can to this banquet table to celebrate with us. Thank you that Jesus Christ made this feast possible. And now let us walk out of here grateful because we are forgiven and we are redeemed. We pray this in, in Jesus Christ's name, amen.